I've never been much of a magazine person. I missed out on them being relevant to me by the time I had interests that would align with what was being published. But as I've made more technically minded and factual videos on my channel, I've been spending a lot more time researching and reading from them. Being able to look back at scans of period correct issues has been an invaluable resource, but was just more part of the research process for me. However, a while ago I had the opportunity to pick up this set of popular electronics from the 1970s to 1990s and figured why not, it might be cool. And it was. Being able to flip through these and see the history of computers unfold like this was an experience unlike anything I'd ever had and instantly changed my perspective on magazines as a whole. After that I started to pay more attention to them and a month later another magazine opportunity came along that not too long ago I wouldn't have paid that much attention to. But after these I happened to be in the right place at the right time with the right mindset and I went for it. Now after much work to prepare and preserve it, I'm ready to show my complete 1975 to 1998 collection of Byte magazine. I had an appreciation and respect for Byte before this, but the idea of actually owning copies of it had never occurred to me before, let alone being able to get every single issue. I've been hiding this in the background for months as I got it all sorted, shelved, and made my plans for how to best protect and display them. But it's all done and ready now. And I couldn't be more excited to share it with you. First off, what is Byte? Byte was a general computing magazine published monthly from September 1975 to July 1998. Its first tagline was the Small Systems Journal, meant to indicate its focus on microcomputers compared to mini computers or mainframes which were still common at the time. Byte was geared more towards computing hobbyists and enthusiasts and started out not only featuring computers that would require the user to program the systems themselves, but also computer kits that would have to be built from scratch. It was created by Wayne Green, who was publishing and editing the well-established radio electronics magazine 73. Byte was conceived as a response to two things, an overabundance of reader submissions on computer projects for 73, and this wildly popular popular electronics issue from January 1975 that announced the Altair 8800 as the first home computer kit. After seeing this, Green brought on Carl Helmers, who had been producing his own small computer magazine, and created Byte as a dedicated publication for computer projects. Green started reaching out to more writers, sponsors, and manufacturers and found much more enthusiasm for the concept than he anticipated. In the article of 73 that announced the publication of Byte, he wrote about how many times the production quantity of the first issue had to be increased, eventually up to 35,000 copies to meet demand. But even after this, he talked about it again at the end of the first issue of Byte and mentioned that it was actually bumped up one more time to 50,000 copies. Now, after only four issues, Byte separated from 73 and Green for complicated and likely private reasons. And in 1979, it changed owners again when it was sold to McGraw Hill. But it was immediately successful, and when it was sold, it was mentioned that it had reached over 150,000 paying subscribers. The computer industry was taking off right as Byte entered publication, and as a result, Byte was there for most major announcements in the industry. Its focus on computation in general also meant it had wide-ranging coverage, unlike other system-specific magazines at the time. It covered the release of many computers, software, and uses which appealed to a broad audience. The content it produced was still top-notch, and they not only had writers on staff, but would also seek out information from experts and designers themselves. They had ground floor access to the prototype versions of both the Radio Shack TRS-80 and the Commodore PET before the designs were finalized. When the Apple II was launching, Byte ran a long and detailed article about the system and how it works written by Steve Wozniak who designed it. And in that same issue, they also had a low level breakdown of how floating point variables work. This multi-focus aspect was a goal of the magazine from the outset that it most certainly achieved. But it also had to change with the times, and as the microcomputer industry as a whole grew, so did Byte. It maintained its monthly issue schedule, but managed to grow to have issues over 650 pages in length at one point. There were only so many pages and so much computer information to cover, so around the time the IBM PC was launched, McGraw-Hill started to pressure Byte to focus more on consumer products rather than low-level projects, which pushed out some writers including Steve Ciarcia. He started out on Byte by documenting his project on building a homebrew vector drawing system. 
and reached the levels of building an IBM PC clone from scratch. After he left, he started his own magazine named after his column called The Circuit Seller that kept the lower level focus. Byte still maintained its general focus though. While the IBM PC went on to set the new standard for computers over time and many publications focused heavily on them, Byte continued to cover other systems as well, like the Macintosh, Atari ST, and Amiga. IBM systems did end up getting many special edition issues though, released between months to give them more space for extra coverage. As most computers in both the consumer and enterprise spaces began to close in on PCs with Intel x86 CPUs running Windows, you'd think that a magazine based around broad information would begin to seem old-fashioned. But Byte managed to stay relevant and keep its readers' interest. In its last couple of years, there was some drop-off in readership, but it took Byte from around 520,000 subscribers to 440,000, which was still very respectable. However, it was losing money. Ad revenue for magazines like Byte with a less focused market was drying up, and the number of subscribers was actually a burden as the price to buy an issue didn't come close to covering the cost to produce it. McGraw-Hill ended up selling its entire technology publication group to CMP Media, who immediately shut down Byte with only two days notice. Byte as a magazine never came back, and while it had a short stint as a website, it never approached what it once was. Other magazines with more focus on single topics continued and new computer magazines flourished. In the end, it was marketing and lack of respect for the brand by owners that took down Byte. At least it can be appreciated for spanning perhaps the most influential period of computer history, seeing hobbyist systems turn into the first generation of consumer computers and ending around the time PCs with Windows had fully dominated the market. There was a lot to learn about Byte for me. It's interesting to take a look at something like this and see how it all unfolded. But I would be lying if I said that researching it for this video was even close to the hardest part about making it. That, without a doubt, goes to procuring and protecting these issues. Over Byte's 23 years of publication, they produced 287 issues. Now, getting a magazine collection of that scale is not something that just happens. I have a lot financially invested in this at this point, but I did have a good head start. After I got the popular electronics issues, a listing was put up on eBay for a nearly complete collection of Byte, and that's what I bought to start this. Unfortunately, some of what it was missing were some of the more valuable issues, so I still had to hunt down some expensive examples. Transporting them was also complicated, because they were in another state. I was able to get someone I knew nearby to pick them up for me though, but this meant taking a risk that the seller wasn't going to pull a fast one since they weren't the buyer and didn't know much about them. But everything worked out thankfully, and I was able to get the magazines a little bit later. After I was able to take my own first hand look at what was there, I was able to order the issues I was missing. Byte really isn't that rare since they always had so many subscribers, but it is desirable, so getting the individual issues still hurt quite a bit. I wish I had more footage of all of this, but this was happening right as I was getting kicked out of my house and moving into both a new place and the office, so I had a lot of things to worry about and filming all of this just wasn't an option. After this though, things started to settle down and I could finally film more starting with me getting the bookshelves and finally being able to sort out all the issues properly. After that, I started working out how to best organize and protect the issues. This is more complicated than you would think. Those 650 page issues I mentioned before? Yeah, they don't make sleeves that can fit those. So I ordered two sizes of plastic sleeves, normal magazine sleeves for the ordinary issues, and huge life-sized issues that were ludicrously oversized. Then I just had to put all 287 issues into the sleeves. Easy, right? Ha. Huh. First, I found out the nearly complete collection I'd bought had been exposed to a slight amount of water before. This wasn't a problem by itself because the previous, and I'll also mention original, owner had acted quickly to save them, and I have yet to encounter any stuck pages, though a few issues did get pretty badly wrinkled. But their method that saved them left a large amount of baking soda in the majority of the issues I had, and at some point this would need to be removed, so I decided while well, putting them into the sleeves, now would be the best time to get that done since it would also prevent the abrasive baking soda from scratching the print or scuffing up the sleeves. This whole process took 
so much longer than I would have thought. Somewhere around 15 hours of nothing but cleaning and sleeving those issues. So I'm just gonna let my footage run while I talk about this some more. Getting the baking soda out of the issues was a much bigger pain than I thought it was gonna be. The baking soda really liked to get stuck in the crease between pages and especially where there were mailing cards stuck in that would make voids the baking soda would fill in. I eventually figured out some ways of identifying which issues actually had baking soda in them versus just on them, but I still had to literally look at almost every page in each of those to find out where it all was. And then I would have to brush it out of the seam. Between doing all of that, I was also putting dividers on the shelves that amazing viewers helped me get. That would allow me to sort these by year. The bottom dividers, though, were a huge pain because this collection barely fits on one bookshelf and I had to put them on the bottom structural shelf. These dividers are supposed to just slide onto the front of the shelf, but if you take the time to put them on the back, it looks so much better. Doing that for the bottom shelf required removing the back of the bookshelf, though, which slides out only when it's laying down, meaning I had to take every single issue off. And I forgot to put the last year on when I did it, so I had to do it all twice. Delightful. After I got all of the issues sleeved, I still wasn't done though. The huge life-size sleeves weren't usable like this and bunched up on the shelf, making it impossible to pull any issues out. So I had to take all of those issues out again so I could fold over and tape or cut the excess material down, basically making custom sized sleeves for every single issue. I got better at this, but it still took about half of all of the time I was working on these. Every part of this was slow, but I persevered and when I finished the last set of custom sized sleeves, I was able to call the collection complete, sorted, and protected. Protected. That was a lot of work, but I'll be honest, there was another reason it took so long. I kept catching myself reading these things because they're just so interesting. I've been trying to keep this whole project a secret so that I can share it all at once, but man has that been hard when there are so many fascinating things in here. Like I found an ad for a Dimension 68000 with an 8088, Z80, and Motorola 68K that claimed to be able to run software from almost any of the major computers at the time. There's tons of cool and crazy stuff like that in these. So let's actually take a look at some of these finally. And I can think of no better place to start than with issue number one. Okay, now to look at this uh, and a few other issues actually, I'm gonna be doing a weird multi-camera setup. So we have an above camera view uh, for my Blackmagic, but I'm also using my Nikon and a GoPro to film a, an off axis shot so I can actually talk to you. And I'm hoping this works out. Both cameras actually have issues. Uh, so I don't know if this is gonna work well, but we'll find out now. Uh, there is kind of a lot I want to talk about and I had issues with this the first time and it took 20 minutes So we're gonna go through this maybe a little quick here um, But there are some great things to take a look at so this is the first issue of bite from September 1975 and oh This is really really cool to see uh, where this publication first started um but right off of the bat here we're gonna have something to talk about um so after we get into this we have this page now when i started researching this uh video and trying to look up things to talk about for byte uh one of the things on wikipedia is that Byte had Microsoft's first ever advertisement in it um, for the basic they wrote for the Altair 8800. And that's not true. <laughs> so uh, if you look at this page, which again, this is in the first issue of Byte, you'll see that this is an advertisement for the Altair 8800 and specifically it's basic language and it's called Altair Basic, uh, somewhere in here. There we go, Altair Basic. Microsoft licensed Altair Basic for them to distribute and sell. Uh, it's not sold as a Microsoft product, which means that the advertisements like this don't mention Microsoft anywhere at all in them. So this is not an advertisement for Microsoft. And it gets even worse <laughs> because 
one month earlier was this issue of Popular Electronics, and bam, right there is the exact same advertisement. So not only was the advertisement for Altair Basic not for Microsoft, it wasn't even first released in Byte. So I actually ended up making an edit on the Wikipedia page to remove that claim uh, because it's just not true. So that was kind of fun. That was the first time I'd done a Wikipedia edit. Um, I've obviously been doing a lot of wiki editing now that I launched Caps Wiki. So uh, that, was, that was fun. The other thing that's kind of interesting in this issue, and I'd seen this uh, when I was looking through it before, is there's this contest run by Godbout Industry or uh, Electronics. And it's like, ooh, you gotta figure out what this uh, company, the secret microcomputer company who's releasing this 40 pin 16 bit processor is. Uh, once you figure out who they are, write to them and they may send you that chip. Ooh. It's natural semiconductor in the IMP16. It's literally right on the next page. So this contest is uh, not very difficult. <laughs> I just, I found that hilarious. Actually, on the topic of this article, um, this is the main article for this. Uh, it's not the one that's advertised here, um, but it is the first one that's listed on the front, which microprocessor is right for you. And this is talking about, uh, I believe, three different chips that you could get. And it's kind of interesting because these are, you would literally just buy the chip. You wouldn't buy like a computer with the chip. You'd buy the chip and then you build your computer around it. But what's also funny about this is if we go to the third issue released here, go to the back to page 86, uh, we'll see a section in the letter to the editor from a William Gates about this article. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of funny because that is Bill Gates and he is uh, saying two things. One, that he's really happy that Byte's being launched, but also um, complains about how they compared the performance of the processors in this issue or in this article. Um, because you can't really compare processors that have different architectures because they don't perform in the same way. Different operations will have different speeds depending on how the instructions work. And it's just kind of funny because he points this out and they agree, yeah, it's, it's not totally, you know, cut and dry. And it's just, it's kind of funny because that's still true today. We really can't compare the performance of all of the vintage computers that there are um, because they're, the way that the processors function is just different. So, like, I have uh, an HP Series 80 computer, the 85 or the 86, that has a custom processor that runs at less than a megahertz. Uh, so it's, it seems like it would be slow, but it's really not that slow. So just kind of funny to see that here. This page, uh, this one makes my skin crawl. <laughs> They're talking about using a blowtorch <laughs> to desolder ICs and then rip it out with vice grips. <laughs> they, they did not have very much respect for these chips. And there's a lot of cool stuff in here. Like it gets into schematic layouts for how to build a system, what timing diagrams there should be. Um, this is really cool. This is, this was how Byte started out and this is how popular electronics always stay. Like you can flip to almost any page in popular electronics. You're gonna see schematics or something. Of course, go right to an ad here. There we go, schematics. Um, and that's, that's more their bread and butter is because they are an electronics magazine and they actually went back to electronics after uh, computers and popular electronics, I'm probably never gonna finish a collection of that because it's missing years. They just didn't publish anything during some years. And then uh, they renamed to hands-on electronics, computers and electronics, and then they went back to popular electronics and then Poptronics at the end, it's just, it's kind of a mess. Um, so my collection is not contiguous and it's not even possible to get a contiguous collection. So probably not going to complete that one. Although I do need to buy some plastic sleeves. I actually ran out of plastic sleeves for all of the, uh, bite issues. So, uh, I had to use the bigger ones on more issues than I would have liked. Oh, there is a lot of cool stuff in here. Um, I don't want to get bogged down in just this one issue though, because there are still more cool things to look at. Um, so let's move on to another issue here um, and take a look at something. 
So the first thing I want to mention here is actually just a, an anecdote. They are obsessed with Star Trek in these magazines. Like I, I, there's Enterprises and Kirks and Spocks and stuff all over these, especially in the 70s issues. And it's just kind of funny because at this point, Star Trek had been off of the air for a decade <laughs> and there weren't, they would have to be watching reruns and those weren't super easy to get. So it's just kind of funny, like a decade later, they were still watching Star Trek somehow and still talking about it. And just, I find that to be hilarious. They're, they're honestly obsessed. Like, I'm not kidding. We'll look at this issue later on. And one of the demonstrations on how to do it, something is drawing an enterprise. <laughs> Anyway, what I wanted to talk about in this issue, though, is uh, actually something else to do with Bill Gates. So it's commonly said that Windows is the most pirated software in existence because every computer needs to run it, essentially. I mean, Linux and stuff like that, obviously. But it's kind of funny because right here is uh, a section talking about Bill Gates having written a letter to hobbyists, an open letter complaining about them stealing Altair Basic <laughs> because one person bought a copy of Altair Basic and this was on paper, punched paper tape and they managed to duplicate it and then were either just giving it out for free or reselling it for like half the cost of the original <laughs> at computer hobbyist meetups. So like one of the first things they developed was actually pirated as their software. And just the effects of software piracy in, what is this, 1976? Yeah, hilarious. So it's been a problem from day one. Oh man, I wonder what the first, uh, oh my God, basic Star Trek trainer, I can't escape the Star Trek. I wonder what the, uh, the first occurrence of DRM is in Byte. I haven't actually looked for that. Um, I can easily do that though, because one thing I've done with all of this, so uh, you might think like, oh, you, Shelby, you need to like scan all of these issues of Byte so that they can be preserved. I don't. Byte has been scanned into PDF formats many times. There are multiple different copies of Byte as PDFs. And I was able to download one of them locally and I extracted text documents from all of the PDF files. So I have just the raw text and I can now use a command that I wrote that will search the text for keywords. And then when it finds a text file that has the keyword in it, it can search the PDF and tell me the page number so that I can find where in one of the physical magazines I have something actually is, which is really cool. So a lot of the topics that I brought up here uh, that we'll be taking a look at, I've actually found by searching through uh, the PDFs and then going over and picking up the literal physical magazine. It's kind of a powerful tool. And one of the reasons why I'm really excited about having these issues, because when I'm doing video research, I can just search in the PDF uh, index that I have and then figure out where in the physical magazines I should go to use these as documentation in videos. It's gonna be super powerful. Let's see, what, what is this? Is this the circuit for Z80s? So this is a, a schematic for how to build a basic Z80 computer. That is cool. Actually, similar to this, let's take a look at uh, two issues here. So these are actually the issues that uh, Steve, I'm hoping I'm saying this right, Steve Ciercia um, wrote uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, one is about his video display. That's the one that is the Star Trek on there. And, and there is this one. So this was the first time he wrote for Byte, and there is a bit of a controversial story with this because uh, he actually ended up, uh, oh, it's not that one. Where is it? Uh, all right, here we go. So another Enterprise, okay. Um, this is uh, Steve Searcy's first article in Byte um, about building a vector display, which is super cool. And it goes into detail on how rastering works and then how using an XY uh, terminal display, he was able to build a vector image display and goes through the process of how you can do it yourself. Uh, this was initially uh, stolen from him, this article, and put into, um, I believe it was Killabot at the time, uh, which was run by Wayne Green. Uh, it was a competing magazine he started after Byte was stolen from him, basically. It's really 
weird. It's not worth getting into. This is one of the last, if not the last issues to focus primarily on a enthusiast level, do it yourself project. So this is Steve Searcy's IBM PC clone that you can build yourself. And it got front billing on this art issue, which is really cool. Cause you think about this. I mean, what, what year is this? 1982. How many people at this time were honestly likely to build one of these? I mean, it's not, it's really cool and it's impressive, but that is a large undertaking for a time when you can go buy VIC-20. <laughs> I mean, you would want a more powerful computer, of course, but you could just get it in different ways. Ah, okay, here we go, this is it. Ooh, Tron. I did not realize there was an article about Tron. That is awesome. Think about this. In order for them to get these images, Byte would have had to scan the film from the uh, movie projection. <laughs> they wouldn't have been able to get these any other way other than by having cooperation with Disney. That is cool. Here we go. Build the MPX-16 circuit seller computer system. This is so cool. So we got five ISA slots because it's mimicking one of the first PCs, not the uh, XT. Um, memory, what is it configurable up to uh, how many? How many kilobytes here? It's probably 64, but it could be 256. 64K, okay. So this is really early then. Um, it looks like it doesn't have an uh, XT keyboard connector, which is kind of interesting. That would have been somewhat proprietary to IBM. And honestly, uh, it was kind of like a big thing to go ahead and get terminal keyboards and then try and uh, connect those to your computer. Uh, there is uh, an article here in the first issue that was talking about this. Where was it? There we go. Literally day one, uh, Byte was teaching you how to take on weird keyboards from old terminals. And there's actually even an advertisement for some of these in this issue um, where you could go buy old terminal keyboards like these that aren't connected to a system that aren't just usable by themselves. And you would have to write your own or make your own uh, interface controller for them to connect them to a computer that you would likely also build. So it's kind of interesting uh, that he was taking that same design style still in 1982. Um, I bet one of these probably, or one of those is the keyboard header um, and that you'd be expected to connect something like an ASCII keyboard instead because there's definitely no PS2 keyboards at the time. I mean, so <laughs> it would have just been make your own. Okay, let's check out something a little later. This is a sort of transitionary period of Byte. Um, and I haven't looked through this issue as much. Um, I just happen to know that there's one thing in particular that will be uh, interesting. And uh, it's right at the beginning here um, in the letters to the editor section again. And this is the first mention of Linux in Byte. And it's someone mentioning uh, in their low cost Unix clone issue that they had previously that they didn't cover this new software called Linux that is free and being developed by a community of people who are not looking to get anything back out of it. And it's just kind of interesting to see it in context at the beginning in a 1992 magazine. Um, and they went on to cover it a couple other times, but it was never really a huge prominent thing. Um, probably because again, they were trying to get somewhat away from the uh, DIY enthusiast market. So it's a little disappointing, but it's still really cool to see uh, something like that in here. Ooh, capture cards. <laughs> Solar panel for... Wow. Uh, oh man, that's it's a little disappointing to see such a crock fake product like that. What on earth? Spaceball 2003 and intuitive. So there are a lot more advertisements uh, in this time period for Byte. 
Ooh, is that an X server for DOS? That's cool. That's an advertisement. That that appeals to me. Ooh, we got a little hard copy thing. Um, I think a little after this time, or maybe during this time, advertisements like this would have been six thousand dollars to get in Byte, uh, <laughs> and that's part of why uh, when the later issues were starting to have difficulty getting advertisers to pay them, uh, they really started to have financial troubles because they were making the majority of so the ads were their primary source of income. Uh, the magazines really didn't get that much more expensive over time. If we look at Byte 1, it was a buck 50. Um, go ahead and skip to 82. Uh, where are we at? It's 350. And then until the end, uh, it really didn't get much more expensive. It only got up to 395 or 399. And they didn't increase the price. Uh, as much as they perhaps should have, especially when they're producing massive chonkers like this. I mean, how many pages is this one? This is over 600 pages, 608, right there. It's, it's ridiculous. So, uh, yeah, they started to scale back the later issues. They're much thinner. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's, what it's, I, I like the ads in these though, because there are a lot of things that, I mean, they didn't have a chance to cover but that they had advertisements for. So it's, the ads are in a way still a historical record of things, although they can't necessarily be trusted. Um, there is something related to that that uh, we should take a look at now. So I'm really excited about getting these magazines for getting historical context and information, especially about things that are hard to find information on. And one of the things I have that's been the hardest to find information on is this which is a Philips CM100. This is the first CD-ROM drive, um, period. And I don't have an interface card for this, unfortunately. I need an LMSI card, a laser magnetic storage interface card. Um, they're not super easy to get, and it has to be an external one. That's the connector for it. Um, but I was trying to find information about this in Byte using my program to search through things. And uh, one of the things that I found instead, uh, which issue is it? I think it might be this one, um, was talking about a different CD drive being first, and it was very confusing. So right here is a section labeled CD-ROM update. And it talks about how they're looking at CD-ROMs at an electronic show and they see an Adventure Inc. or ActiVenture Inc. Uh, demonstration of an encyclopedia disc. This is the Groilers encyclopedia, that's what they're talking about. Um, but then they mention, in reference technology Inc. announced the availability of the first CD-ROM drive with an IBM PC interface. Now, Every piece of documentation I've ever seen says that this, the Philips CM100, is first. And then this goes and contradicts it in context. So that kind of uh, threw me for a loop there. I was like, wait a minute, is it first, is it not? Well, I'm not sure, except I think I know that it isn't. So in a later issue in this year, December uh, 85, uh, we see the first ad for the reference technology drive. Uh, which page is it? I think it's on page 24 here. All right, there we go, page 32. So this is the drive they're talking about. And it's not actually shipping yet, I think. Uh, it says, Visa and MasterCard orders welcome three week delivery, um, only 90 day warranty. Wow, that's really bad for an early laser uh, drive. But this is what it's talking about, um, and it is a drive that connects to your PC. And I looked it up. They uh, reference technology was a part of the High Sierra Group, so this would have been a true CD-ROM drive that should have been compatible with regularly published discs. Um, reference technology has their data drive series with data plates that were two gigabyte discs, but they're literally the size of laser discs. They're enormous, so it's kind of different. So if they had released a proprietary disc format, um, it wouldn't have been too surprising. But it seems like this probably would have been High Sierra compatible. So that means that this probably beat 
uh, the Philips CM100 to market because the earliest uh, article I can find that mentions that was actually in InfoWorld in, I believe, March 8, 1986, uh, three months after this. Except, <laughs> and this gets this is where it gets confusing, uh, the Philips CM100 was not the first uh, consumer CD drive. It was actually the DEC DDR50 or RRD50. I forget which way it is offhand. But that... Uh, was released and is actually the exact same thing as the Philips CM100, just branded by DEC. Um, and the manual for that mentions that it is from, I believe, May 1985. Now, what's interesting about that is if we go back to this page here, we can actually get somewhat of a confirmation of that. Because under where it says Reference Technology Inc. announced the availability of the first CD-ROM drive with an IBM PC interface, it also says down here, both Sony and Philips are shipping evaluation samples of bare drives to OEM customers. Philips had already been sending a full complete drive that it would later use for PCs to DEC just to have them slap their name on it and resell it. So... This is seemingly an incomplete history of this, which is kind of confusing. I wouldn't have guessed that, but it just tells me when I'm using these to do video research, I can't rely on just these for information because they're not necessarily complete. So it's been kind of interesting piecing stuff like that together with these uh, because it's unexpectedly unreliable. That is a pretty cool modem. Uh, but we should wrap this up, so let's take a look at one last magazine by taking a look at the last magazine. So this is the year 2000 survival guide, and this is the final issue of Byte that was ever published. And right when you open it up, it talks about CMP ending the magazine. So they claimed that they were suspending it for a relaunch but they laid off all the staff. It wasn't that they were just trying to figure out how to restructure it. They just completely axed the entire Byte division when they bought all of McGraw-Hill's technology uh, publications. And it's weird that they tried to even phrase it this way because they did try and bring it back a couple of times. They just did it really poorly. So it's really frustrating how they handled it. Um, and you can actually read... Uh, <laughs> a web page hosted by a former Byte employee who vents his frustration over this um, as he was there for the final days, which is how I know they only gave him two days notice because he actually talked about that. So this uh, issue was actually written uh, pretty far in advance, I believe May, um, even though this is the July issue. So they had these uh, kind of in the can. So that's interesting because uh, I'd noticed that some of their issues were kind of delayed on reviewing hardware, and then that would probably explain it if they were that far behind on the publications, but I bet they were probably doing that so they could secure advertisers or things like that. So, ooh, 20 inch or 20 LCD monitors for your desktop. I'm a big fan of uh, early LCDs, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, what page is that on? 90. All right. So, some monitors. I really like these early LCDs. Some of them are way better than you would think. Oh, man. Big old BNC connectors. That's nice. Is that a, uh, let's see, IBM 16 point? Oh, that's that one. Pivot to portrait. Who's this? NEC making a rotatable monitor. Intriguing. Oh, wow. That's cool. Nice breakdown of everything and how it's supported. <laughs> I like this one. Supports Unix. It supports Windows, Mac OS, and Unix, as opposed to other ones that just support any. W what does it not support? I mean, I guess there was probably like BOS or OS2 at this time still. I mean, <laughs> these, these, these support lists are very strange. Well, there's OS2 and DOS. I mean, all of them are going to support DOS. If you can configure your BIOS motherboard or motherboard BIOS on there, you can use DOS interesting so i have a viewsonic one it looks like it's probably what what year is this this is 98 
So these are actually really early for LCDs, now that I think about it. This is cool. I, I'm actually really, I have a video plan where I'm going to talk about super early LCDs. So I actually have uh, the one that I've featured in other videos. It's a ViewSonic 181. Um, but I've gotten early uh, DVI output uh, video card because there were actually LCDs that were available before DVI was really finalized and it made LCDs look terrible when you used VGA with them. So DVI is what really made LCDs uh, a thing. Ooh, advertisement for PK Zip. PK Zip for OS2 and Unix will be coming soon. Enter it. Oh my gosh, $600 for a Zip program? Whoa. <laughs> Okay, that's pretty cool. Backplane motherboard and then an SBC with two Pentium Pros on it. All right, that's pretty sweet. There is still cool stuff to check out, even in the later issues, despite having had mostly consolidated down to uh, just PC stuff. I mean, it's actually kind of funny. In this issue, <laughs> right at the beginning, um, I think it's also page 24, actually, uh, they have... Let's see, letters. Uh, this one's a little weird. So their letters to the editor section, they usually have someone write a question and then they have a response. But in this one, they just have, where's the Mac? I read a November Byte special report on today's and tomorrow's operating systems and was very surprised to find no mention of the Macintosh OS. Have you guys finally become a totally Wintel oriented rag? They have no response. There's, there's nothing. It just goes right on to the next question. It's not on the next page, which is actually just more letters to the editor. Um, yeah, because this one, like this one in the middle here is a continuation of this. Uh, <laughs> it's just kind of weird. <laughs> we'll give Linux a thorough road test in our Unix special report in the February issue. I'm going to have to check that out. I don't really have time to do it today though, because I've actually been recording this whole section for 41 minutes now and uh, should probably wrap it up. Well, I think that is it for now. Um, it is really incredible to have had the opportunity to get everything from the beginning to the end of Byte and to be able to just look through this, get the historical context, use it for research and just appreciate it. Like there's so much still that I could talk about. Like I didn't even talk about the awesome covers that Byte had. I mean, I have, there's probably multiple here. Um, like, look at, these are, they're phenomenal. Byte is very well known, especially the Robert Linney covers. Um, these were all fantastic. Um, well, not all of them, because they did eventually go down to like really boring stuff, but they had a stint where they did some really amazing ones. And there's just so many things Byte is famous for. So I'm really happy to be able to house this collection and to, as these videos continue on, share them with you when I can, because believe me, I'm gonna take every opportunity I can to uh, show these in the future. There's too much potential in these to ignore, so I'm really excited to have them. Well, if you enjoyed this video, you may want to subscribe, and that way you can check out more Byte stuff when it shows up. But that is it for the moment. If you want to support the channel, uh, you can look in the description for more ways where you can buy a shirt. But that is it for now, and I'll see you next time.